you. And then you can take it off during the Q&A session if you want to ask a question of Monster Amos. With that, I'm going to turn it back to our partner patients like me for them to lead us through an overview, and then we'll go into the question and answer. Someone has joined the conference. A half an hour. Great. Thank you, Daniel. I'll try to keep an eye on the time here. Um, and thank Someone you everyone has joined the conference. who has been able to join us here today. Um, as you mentioned, let me see if this is going to work. Okay, there we go. Um, so we are uh, the website Patients Like Me. Someone has joined the conference. And Patients Like Me is a patient-centered, data-driven health insights and research platform. And what that really means is we have a primary focus, which is to help individual patients live better with their conditions today. But we also are focused on improving healthcare through research now and in the future for all kinds of people dealing with health conditions. And right now um, we have over 270,000 patients registered with the site. What our members do when they come to the site is they have options. And one of the things they can do is learn about living with and treating their life-changing conditions. They ask about, is this normal? Is this expected? What's going on? They learn from the aggregated treatment information. Someone has joined the conference. Treatment information that people have posted to the site, um, other patients have posted to the site. They can also connect with those others and share those experiences. So they can search for patients similar to themselves based on age or gender, diseases. Someone has joined the conference. Treatments they've decided to try or have tried in the past. Also on interests or other things that are important to them, um, such as re interests in research or interests in uh, faith-based work. Um, and really it's about the day-to-day -day support and living better together for them in those connections. And then they can also track, and this is what makes patients like me perhaps different from other uh, quote-unquote social has joined networking. The conference social networking or someone um, has joined the conference social networking or uh, forums type sites someone and has is, joined the conference <laughs> and that is that they can track their history and progress over time um, this is really about tracking their own quantitative health data they can document changes in their symptoms they can document the changes in their treatments that go along with those times and things that change their symptoms and their treatments over time and in, in the end this generates real world outcomes research data so one of the main things we do is listen to the community and our community team is really important to us um, the individual patients make up these communities of, of disease focused around diseases but they can also be focused around other areas of interest um, such as around research or around veterans issues our communities are moderated by professional moderators who read and monitor these daily and meet regularly to see if there are themes or concepts that are coming up questions that happen um, both about the patients and their disease and their experiences but also about the site about the research that's ongoing at our site and about other things that are happening outside in the world that they may be reflecting on uh, such as the the healthcare acts and things like that um, as of recently we've had over 878,000 what are called stream events or comments on other people's data. Someone has joined the conference. And over 1.8 million posts in the forums over that time. Patients also benefit from tracking their individual data. Individual patients can track themselves and gain individual insights into what's going on with their disease. This is a really good example where the patient themselves pointed out what their individual insight was. You know, an HIV patient who said, oh, Quick look at my profile, you can see what happens when you stop your meds. You know, there's a pretty obvious uh, connection between their lab values and their treatment histories there. And aggregated across hundreds of patients or thousands Someone of patients. Someone has joined the conference. This aggregated data uh, tracking can lead to more generalized insights and, and see what is going on in the bigger picture in real world data. So at Patients Like Me, we really talk about sort of the, the nitty gritty is there are two categories of data on Patients Like Me. One is this category we call profile data. This is entered by patients at will. They can enter it multiple times. They can enter it longitudinally. You know, every time they visit, they may put in a value. They may uh, come back monthly and update their uh, hemoglobin A1C values, or they may include their cholesterols on their, from their annual visits. Um, it is, however, also sometimes considered to be spotty. Um, patients only enter 
what they want to enter. There is no requirement that they enter anything at all. So this is all strictly voluntary. This kind of information can include structured data such as their condition history, patient reported outcomes questionnaires, labs. It can also include unstructured data such as their free text uh, comments. Someone has joined the conference. And forum discussions, conversations that are going on. And then there is also sort of a behind the scenes section of data that is constantly collected. And that is the web log data. That is, um, when do they come back? What is their activity on the site? Which areas of the site do they visit? Are they someone who reads the forums but never posts? Do they read and post frequently? Do they never go to the forums and only go to track data? We can actually learn a lot about people's activities based on those sort of web log types of data that are available. Then there's a second category of data, the, the supplemental data or survey data that we gather via a research survey tool. And we have this opportunity to go out and request data from patients. So when requested, they come in, they can do a survey, usually it's Someone a single cross-sectional survey. Um, surveys could certainly be served up um, sequentially for a, a quasi-longitudinal or longitudinal effect. Um, and usually it's to a specifically defined or invited population. Although we have done at all surveys where we were interested in a subject that was cross-cutting across a number of different conditions. Survey data can include open text or free text data. It could include multiple choice. We can pull information from the profile, so some basic demographics can be pre-populated from things they may have already told us. And we do have the opportunity to pull through sometimes um, externally validated or external PROs. Um, we do have the Someone has joined the conference. Um, and there, there's the interest in looking at other patient reported outcomes instruments that, that may be of use in particular research studies. Some of the more specifics on some of the profile da data include uh, symptoms. So right now we have over 463,000 symptom reports in our system. Um, and the symptom data is interesting because it's curated by our health data integrity team. When a patient goes to enter a symptom, um, they can start typing in a symptom and a drop-down list will appear of things, uh, of symptom names that have already been mapped to SNOMED or ICD-9 codes so that the patient is putting in what they want to in their language, and yet we're able to sort of, you know, under the hood or behind the scenes, structure that in a way that makes it easier to retrieve for research later. Um, when there's a new entry, if someone wants to include a new symptom that hadn't previously been entered, um, that individual request will be manually reviewed and mapped by our HDI team to some code. So all of these are looked at and we understand how the symptoms sort of roll up in the background to different definitions. We also have outcomes reports, patient reported outcomes. This is an example from MS for the uh, multiple, multiple sclerosis uh, rating scale. Um, patient reported outcomes questionnaires are available on the site for a number of, of uh, conditions. With MS, um, there have been over 21,000 uh, uh, 21, MS patients reporting over 108,000 MSRS reports over time. Uh, with our more generic quality of life instrument, which is available to any patient, we have over 120,000 of those that have been completed over time. What we found is that patients in particular disease areas who have more specific um, experiences on the site, that is, uh, they have a questionnaire that's specific to their disease, are more often more engaged and then also come back and complete those particular questionnaires more often. So there, we do have a number of diseases with specific outcome measures on patients like me. So for multiple sclerosis, we have the MSRS. We have the pulmonary fibrosis severity scale. Uh, for fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalitis, we have the pain and fatigue rating scale. For epilepsy, we have a uh, seizure survey tool that we have developed in-house. For ALS, we use the functional rating scale and the extended. For Parkinson's disease, we have a, a variant of the Parkinson's, the UPDRS, which is the Parkinson's disease rating scale, which is just the patient reported items. We also include the dermatology quality of life index, movement disorder rating scale, autism treatment evaluation checklist, and a very specific scale for neuromyelitis optica rating scale. We have the op options and abilities to add those um, specific instruments for those communities that have received extra attention due to either current or prior research interest 
that specifically funded some additional site features for these communities. We do have treatments also collected for all conditions. Right now, we have over 105,000 treatment evaluations in the system. And treatments are not just prescription drugs, although those prescription drugs are mapped to, um, uh, and I've just lost the name, Multum. Um, but we also have over-the-counters, supplements, and then various other things that people see as you know, things people use to treat their condition. So physical therapy, various kinds of uh, psychotherapy, equipment, procedures are sometimes considered therapies, lifestyle modifications, such as certain kinds of diets, others. Um, all sorts of complementary and alternative medicines are included in these sorts of, uh, of categories as well. And just like the uh, symptom lists, these lists are curated by the health data integrity team. Along with the treatments themselves, we can collect treatment histories, and we have over 715,000 treatment histories. Um, these are curated like systems and include everything from dosage history um, and purpose to evaluation, either when someone is currently taking it or if they report a stop, they're asked to do a treatment evaluation and a stop evaluation. Why did you stop this medication? So a lot of this has been collected on a variety of treatments over time. We also collect labs and tests for all kinds of conditions. And essentially labs, and I'll put that in quotation marks, includes essentially any test with a value that can be tracked. So we think of classic, um, say, blood panel uh, labs as being labs, but we also can include things like blood pressure um, and other things that uh, patients may want to track uh, walking speed, uh, number of steps in, in a, a particular period of time. Um, things that they've been asked to keep track of, as well as things that they find useful for tracking their own progress in their disease. Um, right now, we have over 204,000 labs and tests in the system. The top 30 labs currently collected include a variety of things, um, many of which are associated with the conditions that are specific, that have had some specific research done on them in the past and have requested that these particular labs be entered by patients. But there are challenges with the data that patients like me uh, creates on the site and then also asks for in uh, patient supplemental data surveys. And that is this challenge of the funnel. There's a real funnel going on between what the data is that patients like me has and the population of interest for a specific question and the data that's required at that end. So if we start at the left-hand side, we have potentially the total worldwide population that has a particular condition. And as we go through some of these various stages, filters, um, we come to those people who are just in the, who have, those people with the condition who have joined patients like me, and then those often we want to focus on those in the United States for, for one reason or another, sometimes related to IRB considerations as much as anything else. And then if there's a symptom of interest, it's only a subgroup of those people who have listed that symptom. Um, and then down to a severity of that symptom. So if we're interested in moderate to severe psoriasis, we've gotten way down the funnel here before we have a population that is of specific interest for a very specific research question. So the takeaway from the slide is really how far back up this funnel can you do your research? Can your research question um, be sufficiently answered? And we do better with the broader questions. We can get there with the specificity, but understand that the, the numbers that we're talking about are always greater when we can back out of some of the specificity in the funnel. What I'd like to do now is take a couple minutes and let Emil Chayuzzi um, review our custom project offerings, talking about how some of our data could be used in research. Okay, so uh, as you can see from uh, Marcy's presentation, there is a real broad array of uh, what we call structured data in the system. It's um, highly variable. Uh, you're going to see a lot more data in certain conditions than others. Um, but I think we have reached our 20 million data points. So um, there's, there's a lot uh, of ground that it covers. Um, there is also uh, a lot of qualitative data in terms of what people are talking about and posting uh, on forums. And um, these, cus these uh, custom project offerings um, are uh, based on that sort of available data. 
The third source is when we have to go outside those uh, sources that are in our system and supplement. Someone has joined the conference. And supplement it with survey data. Um, so the, 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 the richest uh, kind of analysis we can do is one that will triangulate those three sources of data. But uh, just as some background, um, we would always like to uh, start as much as possible with a structured data analysis. Um, given our drivers, that's where we'd like to begin. What is the data in our system? Can we answer your question by what we have already? Um, and then, uh, based on what's available, uh, do we need to go beyond that and look at um, other tools? So uh, we, we would like to start with a research question and then tailor the tool uh, to the question. Another thing that's uh, really important to us is that you know, we want to serve the needs of research. Uh, we want to serve the needs of uh, our uh, partners and our collaborators. Um, but we also uh, are uh, really focused on serving the needs of the patients. So uh, the, the projects that uh, I think uh, have the greatest feasibility are the ones that serve uh, all of those masters and that allow us to come up with uh, insights that we can feed back uh, to the patients. Uh, so we have something called givebacks uh, where we uh, conduct some sort of study and then work with our communication uh, department to craft uh, a, a, a set of messages that go out and talk about various findings. And it's usually um, designed in a, an attractive way and uh, done in a way that you know, patients can understand uh, you know, what the findings really are. So here's a couple of... Uh, ways that you know, we can work together. Um, first is to uh, really look at um, uh, what's in our uh, system already and uh, look at the use of uh, structured data. And you can, see, you can see from the range of uh, data types that Marcy was talking about that there's a lot of questions that can be generated. Uh, when you multiply that times uh, 2,000 conditions in the system, um, there is a, an awful uh, lot of room to generate research questions. Um, so in the profile data analyses, uh, let, me, let me talk about some of the different levels. You can go into the site and get a very basic cut of uh, what different uh, conditions look like in terms of demographics and, uh, and various symptoms people are reporting. Uh, so you can go into the site and it, it's a fairly a top level uh, kind of presentation. Um, when people start asking more questions about uh, conditions, um, so uh, how do different conditions compare in terms of uh, reported pain severity? Um, or uh, how uh, do people rate uh, one uh, medication versus another? Or what do they do to handle a particular symptom? Um, that will require more in-depth analysis. We work. Uh, with our data scientists to pull that data out, and they work in conjunction uh, with our statisticians. And then um, we, you know, we, we present a, a series of uh, you know, tables and graphs. We have something called an insights report that we can develop from that. Um, so uh, if we cannot get uh, what we need uh, from the available data, um, there may be uh, questions uh, that you have that are not represented in what uh, Marcy had, or, or you want to dig deeper on uh, various aspects of symptoms and treatments and conditions. Uh, we'll conduct a research survey. And um, we like to keep these surveys around 50 items. Uh, typically, the cross-sectional surveys work better uh, because we tailor the surveys to the language of the patients, we run everything uh, you know, through our, com our communications department in terms of messaging. Um, and, the, and we also have a, a long list of surveys that, uh, throughout the year that we're uh, you know, offering out to the patients. So you know, we need to have uh, a way to uh, you know, organize um, the dissemination of the surveys. 
so there's a lot of messaging involved, and uh, we're very careful about how we're approaching the patient before, during, and uh, after. Uh, we can work in conjunction uh, with you on this, and we um, have a, a survey tool that we have developed that allows uh, a, a uh, sort of a, a cognitive debriefing of questions where patients can comment on various questions uh, before you finalize the survey. Um, so uh, the surveys are uh, all over the place in terms of uh, what, what people have asked us to do, uh, but again, it's, it, it often works best if you can do it in conjunction with our structured data. Um, we also do uh, instrument development. These are much more labor-intensive projects. Um, we go through phases of uh, concept elicitation, feedback, and typically uh, test, uh, retest analysis. And um, we spend a lot of time reviewing the literature, uh, developing the domains, uh, working with experts and patients around uh, items, and then testing those items. Uh, so uh, the use of our survey tools is another big part of, uh, of this whole process. As an aside, we have done other sorts of projects. Uh, lately, we've been um, doing pilot studies with uh, wearables and activity monitors like Fitbits, um, and uh, we're trying to see how different uh, chronic disease populations uh, react to the use of those. Uh, here's a uh, list of uh, some of the publications uh, that, that we have uh, gotten over the years. These are some of the journals that we've published in. We continue to maintain a very active uh, publication record, and uh, we work very closely with our partners on um, getting our findings out into the literature. That is a major motivation. Um, Someone has joined the conference. That, that is a major motivation in our research. So as we uh, plan projects together, we should find a way to um, develop a publication and conference points out of that. And that's um, Emily, I, want to stand on. I want to thank you both for an excellent presentation. I wanted to know, do you want me to have my graduate student explain to people how they can send a text, or do you want to do that by clicking on that orange so they can put in, and they can either type their question or they can type their name so that we can identify people who have questions for you? Mar Marcy, do you want to do that or do you want me to have Joe explain that? Um, why don't you have Joe explain that while I fix the uh, interface on this end for that? Okay. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. If you have a question, there's a little, uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a little orange arrow, and it'll highlight, it'll say Show Control Panel. If you click on that, it'll bring up uh, all of the names of the attendees, a chat window, and a space that says Type Message here. As you have questions, either type your question or your name in there, and we'll go in the order received. What I want to do is, if anything comes up, I'll read it out loud, and then yeah, I'll let you field a couple from your side. I don't see where I can do that. Okay, so um, uh, so if you look in the upper right hand of the oh, webinar oh. screen, the way you're looking at, there should be something that looks like a little orange arrow. Do you see that in the upper right hand side? It's an orange box with a little arrow, a white arrow in it. Oh yeah, I do. Okay, it's okay, way click, over there. Click on that. Okay. Yeah, that's why I thought it would help us to walk through. So for everybody, there's a little orange box in the upper right, it's got a little white arrow in it. Click on that, and then you can put in your name. But um, was that you, Jay? If, Jay, I didn't have a question. Okay. I just I didn't see the little arrow. I'm glad you asked that because I always find that it's hard. Yeah, so if someone does have you can jump in. I'm just afraid that if there's a lot of people, that way that will bring some order to it. But look, it looks as though there's a question. Yes, I, I see a question. So I'll, as the questions come up, I'll go ahead and read them out. Um, so Christopher asks, is there data on the frequency of hospitalizations or visits to the emergency rooms and hospitals? I, I can go ahead and take that one. Yes, we do um, allow patients to indicate if they have been hospitalized um, or visited the emergency room or hospital for a particular condition. Um, some conditions obviously have more of this data than others, um, and it's not quite as robust as some of the others, but it is uh, able to be captured on our site, and we do have some of that information, especially for some of the older conditions and some of the more serious ones. Thank you.
And certainly if people come up with other questions, oh, I see another one coming up there. Has the use of the Fitbit been validated against other accelerometers? That's, that's a current project yeah. right now. Emil, I think you can speak to that a little bit, where we are with it. Uh, we have not reached that stage yet. Right now we're at uh, a feasibility stage uh, with the use of uh, Fitbits. And uh, we are just examining uh, what people do with them. Do they even connect to the system? Uh, we have to, a way to bring the data through an API. Uh, and we are uh, in one study um, asking people what their perceptions of the device were and uh, whether uh, they were able to integrate it into a self-management plan. It's, an un it's uncontrolled, small samples, and uh, we're at the stage where we just want to uh, see what people are doing with them. But certainly over time, uh, we would like to uh, compare different uh, devices and hopefully maximize uh, the use of a device that uh, help, helps people the most. Okay, got a couple okay. other I'm questions. Gonna, I'm, yeah, I'm go ahead. Jump in for a yeah. Um, this is Daniel Monzi, and just um, a couple of people joined late. So again, um, this is a seminar that's being um, you know, sponsored by the Patients Program at University of Maryland, which is an R24 grant from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. We have one of our patient partners um, who presented today, um, and uh, uh, the idea was to present their capabilities with the intent of doing um, future research projects with them. Um, so in my communications with patients like me, what they've decided is that as individuals want to do projects with patients like me, they can send an email message to me as the principal investigator of the R24 patients program, um, and then I'll work with you to get that in the format that we can send it over to patients like me, at which point then they can let you know whether they feel that they have um, the interest and the capacity to do that type of research. What we want to make sure is that researchers at University of Maryland and our other partners that are part of the patients program understand in general what patients like me can do so that we can begin to develop future collaborations with them. And I know a couple other questions came um, in, including um, whether or not these slides will be available. Um, so uh, uh, do you want to address that one, Marcy? Sure, absolutely. I'll go ahead and send the slides to your team, uh, Daniel, and they can disseminate them from there. And my hope is I will check the recording for this particular session as well. And if it has come off uh, correctly, then we should have a recording of the session as well. Um, I see a couple other questions that have come up. Um, how about data on experiences or satisfaction with hospital staff such as doctors and nurses? I know that there have in the past been some supplemental data uh, surveys around um, hospital experiences and have, that have had some questions about satisfaction, but that is not something that is regularly captured on the site. Um, there may be some conversations about that in the forums, but it's not captured in a structured format. Um, how would I go about starting to get information from the database that exists or about adding questions on a particular condition? Um, that's something that I would suggest uh, formulating some questions and checking with Daniel on to see um, how that could best be uh, brought over to us as a, as a query. Um, that's something that I would say, go ahead and circle with Daniel on that one and, and he can help you get started with the process there. Um, can you give us a few examples of research studies that are done using patients like me? Um, so in terms of uh, recent research, I'm going to go with uh, my own background uh, being here in the last two years. We have done work with the uh, type 2 diabetes community looking at support systems and looking, uh, asking about um, preferred methods of receiving support for helping with their diabetes management. We've also had um, questions from uh, risk evaluation and management strategies programs, that is drugs that require additional uh, messaging about the risks and benefits and what patients recognize about the risks and benefits of the medications they're taking and how they would prefer to receive information about that. Um, we did a, a short uh, dive into information about conversations around the Affordable Care Act and information that was gleaned about the conversations that were happening and how people understood the Affordable Care Act and the impacts that it would have on them. Um, Emil, I'm trying to think if there's, besides the devices, that's another big we're one. We're looking at um, uh, people's experiences with uh, depression and uh, respiratory, severe uh, respiratory conditions. Uh, a lot of the uh, studies have to do with how uh, people are uh, coping with a particular uh, 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 symptom. Um, we did a large uh, 
insomnia study uh, last year and uh, really uh, dug deeply into that in terms of learning how people perceive the condition of uh, insomnia. There's actually an interesting follow-up question on that about the current priorities for using the insomnia data already collected. Um, because of that deep dive, we've actually been developing um, some work, some publications, and some additional partners who want to help us look at that data. Um, but the question of insomnia across different conditions and then within different conditions is one that has been especially interesting. And certainly there's a lot of room for work and analysis. Um, especially if you want to dive into a particular area associated with insomnia, we, we are, are really looking at that work very closely. One of the reasons that that fits well is it goes back to Marcy's funnel example. It's a common symptom, it occurs across conditions, and when we investigate that, uh, we can draw in large uh, samples and make lots of comparisons between conditions. Uh, pain would be another example. Um, depression, those sorts of things uh, lend themselves very well if your uh, area of investigation has to do with uh, comparison of experiences uh, across conditions. Another area that's of interest is um, anything that involves examination of comorbidities with a primary condition is something that, that we um, have a lot of since our patients do report many of the conditions that they have and they are different from clinical trial populations in that way it's more a real world population so we do have patients who have multiple conditions and sometimes those conditions haven't been examined together before and that's an area of potential interest we can uh daniel may have it already uh, but we can uh, provide the group with a bibliography that um, shows the various studies i'll send that together with the slide deck again we have an updated version yeah, that, that would be very helpful. Absolutely, that would be great. Um, I wanted to ask a question. Um, you know, I, I think that people oftentimes perceive that this is a wonderful way to get access to patients. But um, you know, partly because I've worked with several of you at patients like me, I thought it would be helpful for one of the two of you to talk about, in your mind, what the ideal partnership would look like. You know, what what um, what skills and what activities, other than just helping us find patients, would patients like me like to see as part of a research partnership with an investigator at University of Maryland? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, that goes partially back to the feasibility issue I was talking about before. Um, the studies that uh, we like to do are the ones that uh, certainly address the questions of uh, the investigator. You know, we want to be responsive to that. Um, we absolutely uh, want to work with questions that have some uh, practical value uh, for the patients, uh, something that we can feed back, uh, and, and also uh, something that helps us advance our platform. Um, we, we do not uh, want to be perceived as a company that uh, does surveys. We really believe that the strength uh, is in the platform and in the capabilities of leveraging the various types of data. Uh, I think that uh, there are certain um, diseases that we call them plm um, that lend themselves uh, uh, better uh, to research. The, the kinds of people who end up using our site are people with uh, chronic conditions that are often difficult to diagnose, difficult to treat, uh, fluctuating course, lots of providers, um, daily self-management. And uh, I think that studies that really uh, tap into those qualities uh, would be maximizing uh, the client base uh, on, on this platform. And then finally, you know, uh, we want to disseminate this. So, you know, we're interested in being able to uh, present these results. I know, you know, I, I guess pretty much everyone on the phone is in academia and uh, is interested in publishing. So, you know, that, that shouldn't be a, a major hurdle. But that's certainly an interest of ours. Can we get this uh, data out? and? Share it. And to the point of um, what people or individuals might might be looking this way too, um, as much as we look outside of patients like me for content, uh, you know, knowledge uh, uh, experts to come to us with questions about their particular area of expertise, we are also very curious to work with people um, who have analytical 
questions and capabilities who look at this and say, what happens if you put the web log data up against the symptom data? What happens if you put the treatment data up against the forum conversations? You know, things that can cross cut some of the data that exists with perhaps a little bit of sprinkling of extra survey or, or other uh, you know, data that we can pull in from patients. Um, I, I think that that is really where there is the potential for some mining that has not been done and that really requires uh, you know, deep analytical roots and an understanding and a willingness to kind of go after some areas that are non-traditional in terms of analytical methods. Yeah, we're definitely interested in learning. Uh, and you know, I, I've been here since January. I'm amazed. There's a lot of research requests that come through uh, randomly. And I'm amazed at the types of questions people are generating. Uh, so you know, we're very interested in creative ways of looking at data and expanding our own world here. Um, and another area is uh, the whole qualitative analysis area, which uh, I don't think we have leveraged enough. And uh, if uh, there are those of you uh, in this group who uh, have an interest in exploring that, and that actually is part of the patient's brand to get into the forums, um, you know, we would be uh, very interested in investigating that further with you. Great. I was also wondering, Emil, if you could talk a bit more. You mentioned these give backs that you do for your own work, but um, for many of the researchers on our campus, they're experts in designing, um, you know, some type of study, whether it's prospective or retrospective. Um, but they're relatively new to the concept of translating and disseminating results. And yeah. so I was wondering if you could describe what give backs are, and you know, talk about how you can help researchers if they're trying to do a PCOR project to to bring through the results back to patients, not just patients um, who are within your platform, but patients in general. Yeah, uh, so we have a, an active community team um, and, and you know, our uh, community group uh, includes people who are moderators. Uh, there are people who have expertise in uh, writing uh, in the patient language and uh, what we would, you know, as soon as we're done with a the study, they're looking for the results. Uh, so uh, we would work closely with them around uh, fashioning uh, uh, the presentation, what the key findings are. And they have a very good uh, finger on the pulse of, you know, what would be uh, of interest to the patients. I, I, are there, uh, I'm asking Marcy this, are, are there some examples that we can send out? Uh, We've, we've disseminated a number of these things by email. Um, a number of uh, things go on in the newsletter, but the uh, an, oftentimes, too, um, the, the blog and video log on yeah. the website itself, um, which uh, I believe those can be accessed without um, entering as a member, um, those have uh, reviewed yeah. some of the research in the past and, the, and have gone over some of the findings of some of the larger projects that we've done in the past. Um, and I know that we'll be having some other upcoming ones along those lines. Yeah, the sleep, the one that we delivered last year for sleep, which that was, went out to lots of people. We, we should uh, get that into there. Uh, I, I think that that was a part of the main newsletter. Yeah, I think that yeah. there's a way to, to get okay. that because I believe it was a separate PDF as well. So we I think that that would be a great one to send over, yes. Yeah, we can send some examples. But, but what, we, what we would do is, you know, once we define the study with an investigator, um, uh, and, and conduct the study, you know, and, and we can do this uh, as a group, uh, invite you into that process. And also, uh, there will be some number of you that may be visiting here. Uh, we're going to uh, put the community people in front of you, and uh, it would be great to uh, find out directly from them how they handle this. I think in any project that we would we would be involved with through the patients grant, the um, the surfacing of how that communications is crafted and done would definitely be a big part of the learning um, that goes on within that project. We have about ten minutes left. Um, um, a number of you sent questions in, but uh, if any of you have trouble finding that box, um, feel free to just jump in now if you have a question. Oh, there's one other that's come in. Um, we'll touch on this. Could you specifically explain exactly what the procedure would be when collecting survey data from members who are part of patients like me? Okay. So what happens is this. Um, let's say that a survey has been crafted, and we won't go into um, the process, but we've decided that we're going to ask 
these 10 questions of a particular population. Um, and with the investigators, we've determined what the inclusion and exclusion criteria should be for that population. We try to stay as liberal as possible in that so that we have the, the most possible, um, uh, the largest possible group to draw from. What we would then do is um, through a process that we have that allows us to filter the users according to those inclusion and exclusion criteria, we would identify um, the members who would qualify and send them a private message in the system saying that a survey is available for them to take. Many of our members, actually most of our members, um, have those private messages uh, trigger an email to them. So they would get an email in their in inbox saying, you have a message from patients like me, and they would come back to patients like me to look at their private messages and see that invitation to the survey. That would include a link to go to start the survey. If it's a survey that has an IRB consent text involved, that would be shown to them. If there was a screener involved, um, say only particular patients that we wouldn't be able to screen for based on the, the profile data that it, they'd already entered were of, of interest, we could do a screener and then thank those who did not qualify and then move those who did qualify into the survey itself. The survey is done um, on our site, uh, it's, it's our own home built uh, survey tool. So we have complete control and access with that. The patients go through and complete the survey questions. Um, and then at the end, they, we usually have uh, one question at the end, do you have any additional comments or questions? Our, our patients have gotten used to being allowed to comment on the surveys that they get at the end. And then they hit submit. Once, once the uh, survey has been started, there is a record of that in our database. So any patient who starts the survey but doesn't complete it would be included as incomplete, but we would still capture any information that they had included up to that point. Um, the, uh, the final data set is uh, given to us in a, in a basic uh, comma separated variable file that can be read in Excel or, or something like that. Um, and then we would be able to uh, take that data set and then import it into one of our analysis tools, or if we were doing analysis in, in uh, tandem with uh, researchers off-site, we would develop, uh, choose which of the secure uh, file transfer areas we would want to use. We would de-identify to remove the uh, user IDs from the uh, data that we use so that they would have just a hashed ID that would have no meaning outside the system, so that you would get uh, essentially a de uh, and semi-anonymized data. Um, we could talk, depending on exactly uh, what the needs were around the data, there are questions about limited data sets, completely de-identified data sets, et cetera. And those can be developed as, as the, uh, the questions about the survey are, are developed and the, the needs for the analysis are looked at. Um, and then that material can be analyzed. Um, yeah, a couple gonna, more questions. Yeah, yeah so a couple more questions there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there a lot of known genetic disorders represented in PLM? That's actually a really good question. I know that we have some rare genetic disorders represented, um, but I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. If there are some particular disorders you're interested in, I would suggest uh, checking the Patients Like Me site. You can actually search on it for a disease without being a member just to see um, what there might be in terms of numbers or um, whether or not that particular condition has been um, uh, in entered by someone. Okay, and I guess yeah. and I actually asked the next question too. My question is more, I mean, there's a particular um, project that I'm interested in that, that, uh, that I'm going to be discussing with, with Daniel later, but I, I, I'm just sort of wondering sort of how, um, how genetics, how family history is dealt with. Is family history one of the things people report and how do they report it? Um, what kind of format and how right. much comp do they protect the identities of the people they talk about and so forth? Right. So um, family history is not collected as such. Patients may include in free text when they're talking about themselves and their histories on the forums or in other circumstances like that. Um, they may discuss, you know, everybody in my family has psoriasis or my sister Jane has psoriasis. Um, we try to remind people that you know, putting information on the internet anywhere is something that you want to be careful about. Um, and we do try to be very careful about um, the, the exportation of 
personally identifying information when data is going off site. So that's something that would have to be discussed around the free text data and, and the approaches that would be used. But specifically to family history, that's not collected that way. Some specific, identify, uh, specific genetic markers are collected by some patients under labs, but not very consistently. Um, uh, about the question about uh, limited internet or not technologically savvy, have opportunities to participate. Um, our website is actually completely accessible via smartphone or tablet, and we know that um, smartphone access is increasing rapidly um, in some areas where there is not, uh, strictly speaking, uh, you know, laptop or, or desktop uh, internet access, but we can't really speak to um, the technologically non-savvy since we do have a self-selected population of people coming to the site to use a computer to track their condition. Um, at, at the same time, uh, and, and we talked to Daniel yeah. a little bit about this, we'd like to find ways uh, to attract more uh, yeah. underserved populations. And that actually uh, goes to the next question, is there wide variation across race and class? Um, we do tend more toward um, white, and uh, more toward higher education level, although not necessarily uh, true economic class. Um, so socioeconomic class is a bit of a ah. variety. Whoops. Um, so we do have a tendency to have the standard internet skew to slightly more female, slightly more white, um, and technologically or, or having access to technology. Um, Class depends uh, on how you want to define it, especially in terms of insurance status. I would say we have quite a range. Um, let's see, can we talk more about the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant? Um, that is the ORE project yeah. information. Um, and actually that's sort of a, a, separate, um, a separate umbrella, if you will. I think that that would be a, a fruitful uh, place to have some conversations about, especially around instrument development, that particular tool is what would be used that direction. Um, and I think that the, the, certainly even outside of the University of Maryland patients grant umbrella, um, talking to uh, the, the ORE team specifically about um, work that you might want to do would be very interesting, and, and I'm, I'm certain that that sort of uh, connection can be made. Um, We've had a variety of investigators approach us around uh, instrument development and, and uh, making had, contact with ORE, so that, that's certainly available to those who are interested. Yeah, I think that right now they're up to like 15 different yeah. um, invest, investigating investigators and investigator groups that have used and, and are using ORE right now for those. Um, what are the capabilities to do a survey assessing patients' needs of pharmacist medication management services? Is that something you would be able to do in the current format you have? That would probably be a supplemental uh, survey. Uh, and we have done sort of around the edges of that, but depending on exactly what questions you're thinking about, that would, that would need to be a, a separate survey question, um, but potentially something that could be done within the, the framework that we're talking about. And again, depending on the population you wanted to look at for that. Yeah, if there are particular medications or treatments or conditions that you're interested in, you might be able to find a way to yeah. marry that with what's in the uh, platform already. Yeah, we'd want to do a little bit of a feasibility check to see, though, if you've got, if those medications or if those conditions are represented in our system to a, a sufficient degree. I don't know if that came from Magali or who that came from, but do you want to follow up um, on that question to be a little bit more um, explicit about the population of interest? Yeah, it was Magali. <laughs> um, so yeah, we 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 really are interested also in um, individuals with chronic with chronic diseases. Um, and what we're trying to see is a, a forum or a platform to gather from the patients themselves. Again, focusing on patient-centered uh, research, getting their uh, their ideas about what exactly they need and expect. So that was pretty much what, you know, we had some interest in doing. Sure. I mean, chronic diseases are obviously the direction that we've taken. If there are specific conditions that you're thinking of that comprise the group of chronic diseases you're interested in, um, you know, that's something that might be useful to uh, let Daniel know and we could examine our system okay. and see if that works. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so we're just about at the... Um, End of the time. Um, so again, this is Jen. I wanted to thank both Marcy and Amel for a great overview of the Patients Like Me program. I really appreciate the fact that you did a very quick job um, giving us all um, a sense of your capability so that we have plenty of time for questions. We will certainly make these slides available, and um, assuming that the audio part was able to be captured, we'll make that available.
available as well um, through the patient platform. Um, and uh, as you heard several times, um, we are interested in forming additional research proposals with patients like me. Um, in, the, in the short run, what we're doing is having people get directly in touch with me. Over time, I think we'll have a committee as the number of proposals increases over time that will help to vet proposals um, um, for two purposes. One, so that we don't send things to patients like me that we would know they could not um, facilitate. And two, so that we can help researchers who are relatively new to patient-centered outcomes research develop a one-page proposal um, in the format that would be easiest for us to jointly go after funding. Um, with that, um, thank you to uh, Marcy and Emil. And uh, as I said, today we did this with patients like me, but we hope to do this with our other partners, both um, uh, communities of patients and um, research partners. Patients like me happen to be in both camps, but um, we'll continue to do this with the other partners of the patients program. And uh, uh, really pleased to see the um, large number of participants. So thank you to everybody who joined us for the webinar today. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.